Man, this is great. I'll tell you what. I've always wanted a conference on separation. All right, frown. We have to get in the spirit of this thing, don't we? Frown, man, separation, standards. Oh, my, that's terrible. Um, a lot of times, though, that's what people think of when they think of separation. If you're separated, you can't enjoy yourself. And yet, I believe if you're separated, you can enjoy yourself more. Because you don't have to feel guilty when you're done. Isn't that right? I mean, if you believe the Bible and you have a Bible, that's the problem with a lot of churches. They don't have a Bible. And as a result, the pastor doesn't have a, a Bible, and him not having a Bible, them not having a Bible. The principles are great, but you got to have a Bible to get the principles. Isn't that right? I appreciate, appreciate what Brother Starr had to say. That is a tremendous blessing. When, when I went off to Bible college back in 1974, I had gotten saved because of the testimony of First Baptist Church in Otsego, Michigan. A pastor, a godly man, good man. Uh, but now I want you to understand that they didn't have all the standards that I have now. There were a number of things that they did that I, I would never do today. But they were good people. They were loving people. And they loved me in spite of all that I was. And I got saved in large part due to the testimony of some of the people in the church. But I went off to Bible college and I went to Tennessee Temple University, which is no longer in existence. They got away from everything they stood on. As a result, they're not there anymore. Uh, but, but I went there and they had a lot of standards that I had never heard before. There were a lot of things that they were against. I, and I did what every Bible college student does when they get to a place to train them for the ministry. I complained. I complained about the standards. My wife had to change the way she dressed. I mean, uh, there are places we couldn't go and things we couldn't listen to. And you know, it wasn't long. I was there about six months and I knew better how to have a Bible college than they did and they'd been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> That's a typical Bible college right there. Now, when a student grows up and gets over that, they can finally be taught something. But I complained. As a result, for 10 months, God set me on the shelf. For 10 months, the only people I won to Christ were kids. I won no adults to the Lord. And that really troubled me. There was a preacher that came to town. If I mentioned his name, you'd know the name, but that's not necessary for this particular illustration. I had never heard him. He was well known in fundamentalism. But there was a church in town that was having him preach, and I thought, I'm going to go over one night, and I'm going to listen to him. He got up to preach, and he announced what he was preaching about. He was preaching about criticism. He wasn't preaching on standards. He was preaching on criticism. He had a four-point message. He only preached three of the points. He skipped the third point. And I was thinking, and he preached for an hour and a half. After an hour of the message, I was thinking, man, if you'll shut up, I'll come forward and get right. <laughs> but I guess the Lord wanted to make sure that I was getting the matter about criticism. After all, didn't God know all the standards that the college had when he sent me there? Evidently, there was something there for me to learn, and I needed to get it. So I went forward that night after hearing that preacher, and I didn't get right about standards. I got right about a critical spirit. I told the Lord, I said, God, I'm going to get in the Bible and find out if these standards are Bible standards. And so I began to study the Bible. By the way, something else happened. I also decided that since criticism is wrong, I wasn't going to criticize anymore. That's what I got my heart right about. I was going to get in the scripture and find out those standards were God's standards. If they were God's standards, I was going to keep them anyway because I love the Lord and I wanted to obey God's word. But even if I found that some of those things were not Bible standards, I promised the Lord, you sent me here and I signed a paper when I came here saying, as long as I was a student at this place, that I would abide by the standards and rules of the school. Now, since I had signed it, for me not to do that would be lying. And I know that lying is a sin. 
And so I told the Lord, as long as I was there, I was going to abide by those stand the ones that I may not believe after my study that they were Bible standards. When I graduated in 1976 from the college at Tennessee Temple, I was able to go to Dr. Robertson and I told him honestly, Doc, when I came here, there were a lot of standards you have that I did not have. And I said, but as I've studied the Bible, I can say that as far as I know, every standard that I have heard preached here is now my standard because I know it's in the book. I mean, this is truth right here. It's an interesting thing when you get in the Bible to study to find out what God has to say with the hard attitude, Lord, I'm going to obey you. When I found out it's in the book, I'm going to obey you because your word is right. That's one of the reasons why my life verse is Psalm 119, 128. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. Now, that doesn't mean that I liked all the standards. But if you decide that God's right and I'm wrong, if there's a standard I don't like, the problem is not with God. The problem is with me. And when I get my heart right, it'll be okay. It is a heart attitude. What you think about the Lord. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. A lot of people, when you mention standards, have a totally wrong view of standards. As a matter of fact, and we get accused of this a lot, many times we have a Pharisee's idea of standards. And their idea of standards was wrong. What is the Bible idea of standards? Where does it come from? If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 15, he says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ, Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. You notice he started out with a principle. And the principle was in this, that our bodies are members of Christ. And that comes down to a conviction. Fornication, therefore, is wrong. I mean, in that one verse, we have exactly what Brother Starr was talking about. Isn't that right? I got a principle. Therefore, this is wrong. He goes on, and make them the members of a harlot, God forbid. What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And hearing some people talk, I thought drinking a Coca-Cola was a sin against the body. Eating white sugar was a sin against the body. Eating food made with white flour was a sin against the body. No, sin against the body is fornication. That's clear, isn't it? It's what it says. That's what makes it so wicked. But he goes on. What? Again. Uh, know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Now look at this. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I believe with all my heart that the Bible is the final rule of faith and practice. And when I got in the Bible, began to study the Bible and got convictions, the reason I have the convictions I have is because I got the Bible, found out what it said. You may not agree with me, and that's fine on my convictions, but I'll tell you, you know, do what? I know why I believe what I believe. And the reason I don't change because some famous preachers changed or because somebody's come along with some slick arguments that are not based on Scripture, the reason I don't change, I've read the Bible. And I've studied the Bible. I long to please God. He bought me. He paid for me. I want to please Him because He has done that. We are occupied by God. We have the Holy Spirit of God living within us. That's great. It's one of the reasons why he says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Why? He lives here. He lives here. I am to be a forgiving person because he lives here. I'm to forgive those that wrong me. I'm not to speak in wrath and malice about those who have wronged me. That's a Bible conviction too. 
Because that's what he says. I am occupied by God. Not only that, I'm owned by God. I belong to him, every part of me. And I am obligated to God, he says, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, quite often, we can have standards whereby we glorify God with our body, but our spirit's all wrong. And that's just as bad. We want to make sure that we're right all the way through. But I said I want to give you some myths about separation. I can think of five of them and then what it's about and hopefully give you a couple things that will be an encouragement and help to you. Number one. It is not a requirement for salvation. Brother Starr mentioned that. That's what legalism is. Legalism is when you add anything to the gospel. That you've got to do this or do that. You've got to be baptized in order to go to heaven. Uh, that's legalism. You've got to cut your hair in order to go to heaven. That's legalism. You know, salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone. That's very, very plain. What you do and don't do really has nothing to do with you actually being saved. I don't do anything in order to go to heaven. The things that I do or don't do are because I am going to heaven. And that's the difference between being saved and lost. So number one myth is it is not a requirement for salvation. Number two, it is not the root of spirituality. He said, bless God, we gotta be, we've got to be spiritual because we're separated. But the heart is the root of your spirituality, not your standards. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. I've often told our people, really, it has a lot more to do with the direction that you're headed rather than where exactly you're at in the road. I didn't get all my standards in one day. It took a while, but I had a heart that kept heading in the right direction, and that's what counted. I mean, I can go, by, God called me to preach. Man, there were a bunch of standards I didn't have yet, but I desired to serve the Lord. I was on fire for the Lord. I loved his word, and even though I hadn't been challenged to get into it about some things, I was moving in the right direction. That's why he could deal with my heart later on. I didn't stop. There are some people, they've gotten way down the road. They're way down here. But unfortunately, they've turned back. And now they're here. They look more spiritual than the guy who's over there who's headed in the right direction. But they're not. God wants us to have a heart that is perfect toward him. We need to understand and get this clear that our standards are not the root of our spirituality. It is the fruit of our spirituality. Problem with the Pharisees. Jesus raked them over the coals in Matthew chapter 23 because, oh yeah, they had all kinds of standards, but it all had to do with how they appeared before men instead of having a heart to please the Lord. Your spirituality is not based on what you do for Christ. Your spirituality is measured by what you allow Christ to do inside of you. And if you can have that kind of a heart, to let Christ do something inside of you, it'll be amazing how far he'll take you. And by the way, just because you get satisfied with where you're at doesn't mean that it has, doesn't have some other things for you to learn over there. You keep moving in the right direction. Not only that, separation is not a retreat or release from our responsibility as a believer. Uh, you see... <laughs> I've got things that I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I can have all the standards in the world, but if I'm not doing that, I'm being disobedient to the Lord. We have a responsibility to win the lost. We have a responsibility to love people, to seek to reach them. I mean, we've had people leave the church because they didn't want their children blemished by being around the bus kids. I'm sure you've probably had that too. Uh, that tells me, what a bad attitude. Man, they want to be separated, but they want to be more separated than what God wanted them to be. In the wrong areas. They had missed the point. 
I have, I have standards because I love the Lord and I love his word and I have the responsibility to reach them, all of them with the gospel of Christ. They surely don't have my standards. I mean, my children, man, they were in junior church with the bus kids and that's the only place that they heard the language that they ought never hear was in junior church. But I didn't figure it would ever destroy them because I wanted to teach them that their love for the lost must be paramount. That's why Christ came. Paul wrote, and he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The fourth myth is this, separation is rules driven. Separation is not rules driven. Separation is relationship driven. Romans chapter 7 and verse 6 declares, But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of letter. And let me just clarify that about the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. The spirit of the law goes far farther than the letter of the law. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. The spirit of the law says, you'll not look on a woman and lust after for that sin. Now, Jesus made that plain. Go through the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew chapter 5. And he made it plain that in every case, the spirit of the law goes much farther than the letter of the law. You see, if we have a spirit for God, then there, we're not even going to get close to sin. We're going to make sure that our lives have a testimony of righteousness and holiness. It's in Galatians 2.19, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 5, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, Hereby we know that we are in him. When Jesus is talking in, on the night before his crucifixion in chapter 14 of the book of John, he says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. What he's saying, if you love me, you'll keep my word. It has to do with your relationship with him. Do you love him? Is it about him? Is it your desire to please him? You see, almost all the complaints about standards and separation is because we love our flesh or we love the world and we want to please our flesh. Now, Paul understood about his flesh in Romans 7, 18. He says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Why do I want to please this flesh? And it's carnality, it's sinfulness. All we have to do is read Galatians chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. And then he gives us the works of the flesh. He says the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then he's got a long list of things there, of things that are simply the lust of the flesh. Man, who are we going to love? You're going to love your flesh? You're going to love God? Thank God. You're not going to live in the flesh and please the Lord. You're not going to do it. And if God, knowing him, loving him, is paramount, that'll take care of a whole lot of things in your life. Most all the problems that any Bible-believing preacher has about standards from his people is because they've fallen in love with themselves or the world instead of Jesus. They need to get a relationship, a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Why well, he bought us? That's why. Let me give you a fifth thing. Separation, this is a myth. Separation is a reason to lord over other believers. And when people do that, I wonder if they have read Romans chapter 14. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. He talks about meats and he talks about uh, Sabbaths and so on and the differences that people had back then. He's trying to get these people to understand their responsibility to still love one another in Christ. 
Now, let me just say the things that are mentioned in Romans chapter 14 are things dealing with the ceremonial law, the meats and the Sabbaths. But when it comes to the moral law of God, that's still sin. The Bible says, whosoever, transgress, whosoever sinned transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. We've well, got to make everybody else have our own convictions. Now, I, I, I've got some preferences. I've got some things that in our family that we set up to be protections for our children. By the way, with our children, we did not draw the line on the edge of sin. The reason we didn't draw the line on the edge of sin is because we didn't want when they went over the line to be in sin. What we wanted, we drew the line where it was safe. So even if they stepped over our line a little bit, they still weren't in sin. You understand what I'm saying? I think any parent, surely you're not going to let your child walk up to the edge of a thousand foot cliff and look down. Man, you want to you stand back here. You're, I'm not even going to stand up here at the edge of the cliff. Those rocks give way. One little slip, and you're done. You have to be careful about that. Well, what's the meaning of separation? Well, separation standards are a right response to grace. I appreciate your mentioning about this thing about grace. Uh, they call themselves, well, some of them call them hyper-grace people. Um, they're false grace people. They do not have a clue what the grace of God is about. And they think somehow because they're saved by grace, everything has been made okay. But go over to the book of Titus chapter 2. I don't believe you can get a clearer passage in the Bible on the grace of God that brings salvation. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. This is so plain. He says in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, Teaching us, okay, so the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us some things. Is it going to teach me now that it doesn't matter what I do, that anything I do is all right with God because he understands? By the way, most of these false grace people, hyper grace people, whatever you want to call them, most all of them have to be Calvinist. And the reason they have to be Calvinists is because by Calvinism, they get the excuse that because they do it, it must be foreordained by God, therefore it must be all right. I wouldn't be doing it if God hadn't ordained that I do it. Of course, that ends up being a wide open door to commit adultery, to commit immorality, to commit drunkenness. And that's what they hide behind. It must be okay. And I'm under grace. Listen, I met a man not too long ago who was living in open adultery. And I said, and he claimed to be a Christian. And I said, how in the world do you square that with the Bible? He said, I'm under grace. I said, man, you need to get a clue. Look at verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Now, how are we supposed to live? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world? Boy, that goes along with Romans chapter 1, verse 18, when he tells us, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You know, these hyper-grace people, they think that the idea of the wrath of God ever being poured out on any of his own people is folly. That God would never do that. He said all men. And then he gives us a list beginning in verse 29 of Romans chapter 1 of all unrighteousness. Do you know that disobedient to parents is part of all unrighteousness? Envy is part of all unrighteousness. And the wrath of God is against it. I don't care who's doing it. Matter of fact, we can find in Psalm 106 where God says that he came to the place with Israel that he abhorred his own inheritance. That's pretty strong language. He loved them, but he abhorred them. See, how can God do that? He's God. God knows who he is. God knows how he feels about things. 
And he's just really plain about things like this. As a matter of fact, he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. If any, he didn't say if any man likes not. He didn't say if any man hates the Lord Jesus Christ. If any man ignores them. By the way, who's he writing to in that book? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to the church of God at Corinth. And he gives them a reminder if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's all about relationship. God wants us to love him. And the lawyer came to Jesus and said, what's the great commandment? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy mind. See, we're to love him in every fiber of our being. Love him completely. If amen, love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. See, if you don't love the Lord, love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about loving Jesus like you love popcorn. Loving Jesus like you love your car. Loving Jesus like you love your cat. I mean, that's how we use the term. We love everything, don't we? Oh, I just love this chair. It's so nice. Honey, I want you to know I love you very much too. <laughs> what? No wonder our relationships are so messed up. We can't even get our words right. What does he require of us? To love us. Here he says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. That's strong language. The problem is here. When we get honest with ourselves and understand that this matter of separation is all relationship based on how we feel about him. When you fall in love with him, it's, Lord, can I give up anything to please you? Would, would, would that make you happier with me? Lord, what is anything in my life that shouldn't be there? Lord, I'll get right. I'll tell you what, if you've got that kind of a heart, you'll be one of those who will walk the aisle often. When God shows you an attitude that's not right, you're not going to sit there in your seat at the end of, during the invitation and say, well, it's just a little thing. I'll just take care of that. No, you'll get it right right then. You'll keep a tender heart. When the preaching is given, you want things right because it has to do with not rules, but a romance with the Savior. You have fallen in love with him. That is, that is the key. They say, can you prove that to me in scripture? I can. How about that? Turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, of course, we've got the letter to the church at Ephesus. And, and you look at this letter. These are pretty good folks. These are separated people. He says in verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. You look at this and man, these people were hard workers. They labored. They were patient in their work. They didn't work for a couple weeks and then quit. They were patient. He said, you cannot bear them that are evil. Well, that's what David says in Psalm 139. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. That's what the psalmist said. That's how these people felt. And then he says, and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Now you look at right there and every pastor would love to be pastoring these people. Every ministry is taken care of. These people are separated unto him. Somebody comes in with false doctrine. You're not preaching here. You're not teaching Sunday school here. You're not going to have any part in that. Good church. But then he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. How serious is that? How serious is that to the Lord? I mean, with all that they're doing, Lord, really? Because their love doesn't seem to be there, is that really such a big deal? Well, you find out in the next verse. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen 
and what? Repent. That's the same thing you'd say to a drunkard, wouldn't you? Repent. Same thing you'd say to an adulterer, wouldn't you? Repent. This church, they're not in to practicing sin. They've not fallen for false doctrine. But they've also not kept their heart. And he says to that church, remember how you used to be. Remember from where you've fallen. And he says, repent. And then he says, and do thy first works or else. Okay, what's the or else? The or else is this. I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now, because of that word candlestick, in the immediate reading, some people say, I, I don't get it. How is, how is this very serious? Take, go take the lights out of the church? What is he going to do? Well, the answer to that goes back up in verse 20 of chapter 1. In chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 20, he says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. God looks at this church. Doctrinally, they are as sound as they can be. They're only going to have the right kind of preachers in. They're hard workers. They have knocked themselves out in serving the Lord. And they've been faithful over a long time. But they've left their first love. Headwise, they're still right. They still got the standards all in the right place. But they've left their first love. And God says, you repent or else I'll remove your church. I got news for you. God doesn't need us. He loves us. And his first requirement for us is to love him. And if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Church, You've left your first love, you repent, or else I'll come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick. I'll remove your church from you. What a great church you're in. Doctrinally sound, hardworking, and been hardworking for years and years, and people have sacrificed. What's the biggest danger here? That you lose your first love. Because that's when God says, if you don't repent. He said, no, 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 no. We're not into hyper grace. We're not into Calvinism. We're still standing for... If you don't repent over losing your first love, you will lose your church. And God says, I'll see to it. And that's not the gates of hell prevailing against it. That's hearts that have become lukewarm. Oh, they're still doing everything they're supposed to do. But their love has fallen by the wayside. Other things are more important than him. I know we live in a world with all kinds of cool toys, all kinds of things like that. If we're not careful, we get to love in that. We get to love in all the electronics. We get to love in all the special effects, all the things we can do. When we need to understand, it's our love for him that he desires the most. I heard a preacher tell the story, a preacher friend of mine, good friend. He went to see a family that he had been good friends with in Bible college. And this is several years ago now, but, and they were expecting their first child. I mean, they were just really excited about their first child. So this preacher and his wife, thought they'd make a trip over just to see his good friend from Bible college and, and just congratulate him. And so they were over there and they began to renew acquaintances. And finally, uh, the wife said to my preacher and my preacher friend and his wife and said, listen, we've got some new baby furniture and we love it. Would you like to see the baby's room? And they said, well, yeah, sure, we'd love to see the baby's room. Well, actually, his wife said, yeah, we'd love to see the baby's room. You know, the men just do it because it's not worth it to say no. Anyway, so <laughs> they, went, 
They went into the bedroom and there, beautiful baby bed, beautiful playpen. I mean, everything was just absolutely gorgeous. The place to keep all the clothes and everything. They said, man, this must have set you back hundreds of dollars. And his friend and his wife looked at one another and they kind of smiled. And, 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 and my preacher friend just said to him, said, listen, where'd you get that? I want to go out and get something like that. Tell my people about it because this is gorgeous. And he said, well, <laughs> kind of embarrassed to tell you, but I got it at the dump. Oh, no, 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 no. Nobody in their right mind would ever throw away this stuff. Oh, well, you have to understand, at the dump, it didn't look like this. I mean, it had all kinds of stains all over it. It was nicked here and there. He said, but we saw it, and we saw the potential of it. And we just fell in love with it. And so we went and brought it home. And he said, I can't tell you how many hours of work that we spent on sanding this thing, varnishing, doing everything that you could do, painting it, getting it all the right colors. And he said, yep, this came from the dump for our son that's coming. My preacher friend said, you know, when he said that, it hit me. That was us. We were on the dump of sin. And the Heavenly Father looked down and he brought us up out of the trash of the world, saved our souls. He didn't save us to keep us like we were at the dump. He's cleaned us up so that we can be trophies of his grace. And for that, we ought to live like trophies of his grace. And if you love him, you will. It's not about the rules. It is about your relationship with Jesus.